See you on Friar Podcast. Uh, another week with two episodes. Derek Togerson is here. Our trusty producer, Fernando Ramirez. You don't see him, but he's in the room, hanging out, listening. He's in. been on the podcast before. He, we, he's people, been... people know Fernando's lovely face. Well, and you know, if you're a Compas fan, the Compas Empire. You know how many how many podcasts do you guys have? five different podcasts we're just doing one measly padres podcast and he's rolling off like five of them the compass we are slackers empire i know we need to pick it up uh we did have a uh, an extra a bonus episode i posted um tuesday i can't keep my day straight i had a chance to talk with aj castville dennis lynn and sammy levitt in peoria and so some fun conversations with those guys so check that out if you haven't already and uh here we are in our normal thursday time slot to uh discuss the uh, continuing developments around the san diego padres first things first thanks to ogs the sponsor of the on fire podcast order ogs for your next party or next time there's a big game that you want to check out we got the ncaa tournament coming up in a few weeks so uh, i'm sure there's going to be a lot of activity at your local ogs they've launched the san diego state Aztecs. that's right can we let's get a couple wins let's make it to that second weekend uh they've launched a feature item a feature menu i should say that highlights three limited items at ogs buffalo cauliflower who doesn't like that a charcuterie board and even a cold brew espresso martini these items only available for a limited time at select ogs location and of course, there is the OG's rewards program that we've been talking about for a while. Head to OG's.com to sign up, download the OG's app. You can now visit your local OG's, eat pizza, drink beer, earn rewards, OG's rewards available at select OG's locations. Derek, how about the walk up music? Do it. Joining you on the eve of the first Cactus League game of the 2023 season. I know that gets you fired up, Derek, doesn't it? Some real real baseball. I mean, kind of real baseball. It's, it's still better than preseason football. <laughs> it's true. And, it's better than the NBA All-Star <laughs> game. Yeah, no, literally nothing is worse. I mean, even the NBA All-Star game is better than watching preseason NFL football. Yeah. A week four game doesn't get you fired up. Some position battles for the 53rd man on the roster. No. No, it's just they're they're not trying. They don't they don't, they don't care. They just don't care. Nobody cares. No. If if they if they are not going to care, I am not going to then insert caring or any kind of emotion into it. They and they have proven multiple times, time and time again, yeah. they don't care. They don't yeah. want to be there. They don't want to do it. And it's the old argument: college players, you know, they don't need a preseason. They go right out, and then Auburn true. plays Oregon, and you get a great game to start off the season. Why do you need preseason football in the NFL? It doesn't make sense. If you can't evaluate your team well enough without seeing them in some meaningless games, just so the owners can sell a couple of extra, yeah, throw a couple games. Fernando in there was just doing this. God. <laughs> well, uh, thank you, try Fernando. Thank, exactly. thank goodness for uh, thank goodness for the Cactus League. And after a couple of weeks in Peoria, we get to see these guys and uh, obviously going to be a bit of a different type of uh, spring training schedule in that uh, you Darvish is already with Team Japan and, you know, folks like Soto and Machado and Nick Martinez and the Bill Chrismat and the list goes on. We'll be going kind of their separate ways, uh, but some opportunities for other guys and those position battles and, you know, maybe more time for a guy like Jackson Merrow, who we've already talked about and, you know, kind of looking ahead to the future. And of course, you know, the, I think the most eyes will be going to Fernando Tatis Jr. So far uh, returns have been very encouraging and Bob Melvin's just been kind of raving about what he's seen from Fernando Tatis Jr. He called, quote, one of the great athletes in all of sports, uh, called what he's done so far remarkable after multiple surgeries. Um, I it, We'll see when we see him. Uh, Melvin said pretty definitively it's not going to be in Friday's game, but at some point in the first week. But um, as is generally the case with Fernando Tatis Jr. and the Padres, when you're talking about the team and watching the team, eyes tend to kind of go towards that guy. Well, I mean, you got an elite talent, elite athlete. Eyes go to them just regardless. 
You know, you you're watching the Chicago Bulls layup line. Who are you watching, Michael? Tony Jordan? Kukoc. Yeah, you, you, no, you're not. You're, you're you're not you're not watching. Um, Dicky Simpkins. You're watching, you're watching the the Pistons back in the day. You're not watching Bill Lambeer. You're you're watching Isaiah Thomas. You know, you're, that, that's just that's just the way it goes. You look to the elite athletes. You're not watching the offensive line in pregame. You're mm-hmm. watching the quarterback in pregame. That that's that's just how it works. Yeah, no doubt, and. Um... And on top of that, there's just all the intrigue of, you know, the the layoff and how he's feeling and the return to game situations. And it sounds like they're holding him back, not because of like how he's looked, because, again, Melvin has just uh, raved about what they've seen out of Fernando Tatis Jr. But he spoke a little bit uh, Wednesday just about kind of like the baseball instincts and how he wants to slide and, and that sort of thing. And it sounds like, you know, they. I don't think they're having to bubble wrap him to the extent that they did in 2021 when that shoulder was just kind of barely hanging on, but it seems like they want him to be a little bit more mindful about putting him uh, himself in positions where he's less likely to tweak something. And so it seems like just kind of getting his mind right in a place where, um, you know, he's not going to go and, and just play the way he's always played where he can just use his natural ability and his limbs are made of, of rubber and he can just kind of do whatever he wants. Maybe just kind of rein that in a little bit, be smart, be responsible, especially since it is a preseason and um, you know, again, avoid any sort of situation that could cause him to miss any sort of time. That was my read, at least on what Melvin had to say. Yeah. It also feels like um, the wrist is farther behind than the shoulder is. The shoulder seems to be okay. The, the wrist may be having a, a little bit more uh, trouble ha- getting up to speed where he's able to do pretty much everything, which, again, when he, that's the one he's had a couple of different surgeries on. You know, that's that's the one that it was probably going to need a little bit more uh, uh, tender, loving care to, to get through it because you're talking about bones healing, and bones, they get, they're going to heal on their own time. You know, you can, you can help out, you know um, – soft tissue when you start getting into the the skeletal structures then it's, it's a little bit of a different story but if he is on that right track you know and he's and he's 100 percent with the shoulder and you know by all reports so far that in another you know six weeks he, he if he was on the opening day roster he would be okay with the wrist but the extra 20 games might actually be what he might need to be 100 percent anyway with the wrist so we'll, mm. hey, this is all complete speculation but as long as long as the wrist is okay then we should see the same guy that we saw 2019 before the the back problem the mm. whatever whatever the the stress reaction we 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 should be seeing the jump man Tatis with a little <laughs> bit more pop that would that I I wouldn't I wouldn't say no to that no no not at all and um you know the wrist that he he had the the second procedure that was in October so that was more recent as well so you know I think the timeline probably has something to do with that um so yeah i mean that's it's i think everybody's gonna be clamoring just to see him out there and then once they get into the season i think he's got i gotta brush up on all these rules but x amount of minor league games that he can play in if if uh if memory serves so you know how they handle that and when he starts playing and and this and that it's obviously going to be kind of a continuing um uh, storyline to watch but um obviously uh an incredibly important kind of piece of the puzzle for the padres and you know hasn't played in you know, 16 months or what have you. Um, so it's, it makes sense to ease him back in given all that he's kind of been through, but um, at least, you know, and Melvin's also talked about like the smile. He's had a smile on his face every day, just wants to help the team, willing to do whatever, all that stuff. And so, um, and I think in observing him and other people have, have said the same thing, he feels very, he looks very much like Fernando Tatis Jr. Like if you didn't know any of what happened the last year and we're just watching, you would have no clue that he went through kind of some personal things and the injuries and, you know, some self-inflicted stuff and, and you know, all the healing that had to, you know, happen physically and emotionally. You would just never know because he's got a smile on his face. He's having fun interacting with the guys. And that's what you want to see because he's brought a lot of joy to the fan base and to the team and, and guys tend to feed off that. So that's that's another huge positive. Yeah, you play this game, man. You you got to have fun if you're going to play it because you're out there for 162 games. But this is a much even a bigger reason to get the minor league baseball package. So it's a good good thing we're, we're going to have that. <laughs> watch watch Toddy down there for for a couple of weeks. Um, it, he's and, and really every, everyone's at their best when they're having fun, right? If you're having fun doing something, you're just going to do it better. Except Tommy Pham, who I think just never figured out the whole having fun part of this. But 
if you're having fun, you're gonna you're just gonna perform better, right? You're looser, you're more into it. And that and he more really maybe more than anybody else, he's a guy who if he is loose and, and he's you know, locked in, there's there might not be anybody better other than Shohei Otani. You just put him aside because he's he nobody can touch that guy anyway. It's nice to see that he really is able to um it kind of not have to tiptoe around. And Joe Musgrove talked about this during Fan Fest, where he was saying, listen, you don't want the guy to have to feel like he has to go around showing everyone how upset he is and how sorry he is and how mm. remorseful and how contrite he is. You don't, you don't want that to be putting putting a, a silver cloud over himself. You want him to understand that he's done something wrong, but we also want him to know that, listen, we've talked it out. We understand. Don't show us that you feel awful. Show us that you're you're better by being better. Move forward. Leave it in the past. Move forward. Learn from it, and let your actions speak from now on. And I think that was a great lesson from from Joe, who's become really the team leader, as we've talked about many times on this podcast. Because there is a little tendency, you know, you want you want people to know that you're remorseful, and sometimes you feel like the way to show that you're remorseful is to you know, kind of put your head down, like, man, I'm, I'm saying sorry all the time. But if you've gone through that with your teammates, you're okay. And now go out and play the game with joy and make the right decisions from this step, from this moment forward, and you're going to be all right. Yeah, no doubt. And uh, again, there's been a lot of time, and and you know he obviously had the opportunity back in August to to address the guys. And I think um, after last year, everybody's ready to kind of move on, move on from that. And maybe. You know, maybe haven't gone through that, haven't gone through Joe's contract situation. Like there's another kind of big thing looming around the franchise, and that's like the Manny Machado contract. And and maybe those experiences having to kind of compartmentalize some of that stuff or just kind of hunker down and, and put it put it all aside and and handle business, which they obviously did to a high level last year, um, will help them navigate another year where you've got the Machado stuff that's hanging around. What kind of reception is Fernando going to get when they're on the road? You know, that could be a thing. The expectations, all that. Like they had to deal with some like mental, emotional stuff last year. And, you know, it's probably a good experience to have now going into the season where that's going to be heightened in different ways, um, but still going to be very much a thing when you have the targets on your back, you have a guy, yeah, multiple guys. I mean, people like to give it to Manny Machado when he's on the road and they're probably going to like to give it to Fernando Tatis Jr. now when they're on the road. Um, so going through those, ex those experiences, I, I, I figure can't hurt. Um, we should probably talk about the Manny situation now that we've heard a little bit more and we've heard from AJ, we've heard from Peter Seidler, we heard from Manny again on Monday um, about the situation. You know, there was the reported February 16th deadline. We've heard reports of what the Padres offered, uh, you know, I think we'd all say a pretty low, a modest figure. We also heard that about Joe Musgrove. What was it? Uh, eight years, 11 per, and then they ended up getting 20 million, you know? So uh, right. a lot, a lot can change over time. There was the reported ask of 400 million over 10 years. Um, and then a chance to hear from Seidler and Preller and both those guys, you know, stating the obvious, but good to hear from Seidler, you know, saying Manny is my top priority, which you'd expect. They have a close bond. I think they have an understanding and appreciation of what he's meant to the team and to the clubhouse. So um, just given what we've heard the last couple of weeks, what's kind of your read on, on where things are? And do you have any inkling you like to make predictions, any predictions on how this thing's going to kind of play out? I would like to say that they're going to get something done before opening day. And maybe they would if the World Baseball Classic wasn't happening. Manny's going to be gone for a long time mm. here. Um, probably gets pushed back to after the season. But mm. I, I do think that Manny's going to continue to be a San Diego Padre, probably for the remainder of his career. That that would it seems like it's still too too good a fit. They're they're too perfect for each other. They both both the organization and the player and the man have all grown so much being in this relationship. There's there's a lot of, of good positive things going on here. I and maybe this is me being a little Pollyann Pollyannish, but I think there's that's enough to keep them together and have everything continue to move forward. Now, I heard about the you know hey six years one oh five that may basically basically what it turns out to is for the next eleven years is. We'll give you five million more than Xander Bogart's got, which is freaking stupid. That's not going to happen. He he deserves more than that. He deserves yeah. substantially more than that because he's six months older than Bogart's, so age is not an issue, and he's put up dramatically better numbers than than Xander has. 
I'm not saying anything bad about Xander Bogarts. Those are the facts. So you're looking at, like I said, three. 50 of trade, they were willing to give Trey Turner in the $340 million range, which thanks John Heyman and screw you for trying to get that public. So now we have a negotiating tactic for Machado. Yeah. That and judge. Yeah, exactly. And then the judge and the, the judge thing, Manny's not getting 400. All right. Maybe even Steve Cohen would not give Manny Machado 400 million. Aaron judge just came off setting the single season American league home run record. He's a, he's an other world. He's a he said almost like like Thor. He's like a superhero, right? <laughs> Manny is just he he he's his value was in his consistency, not in his ability to take over an entire season at the plate. That's what Aaron Judge does. He's not getting Aaron Judge dollars. So where is he? He's not four hundred, and he's not two eighty five. What he's like I said, he's three fifty. He's three sixty. He, he's he's Mookie Betts. Hmm. He gets the Mookie Betts contract. Everybody's happy. And if you look at an average annual value, only difference there is about six and a half million bucks a year yeah. for the Padres from their perspective. Now, again, you're looking at paying a guy, you know, thirty six and a half million dollars who was going to be 40 years old by the end of this thing, who's probably not going to get you that kind of return on the investment. But again, we're fans. We don't give a damn about what's happening in 2033. We want to know what's happening right now. We want to know what's happening yeah. in the next three, four years because the window is wide open. So what happens? They go to Manny and say, okay, listen, scrap the rest of this contract, 10 and 350. Let's go on and win ourselves a couple more championships. That's what I would do. That's what I think is fair to both sides. That's what certainly Manny Machado was worth. Maybe it's a bit of a hometown discount, again, given what some you know, a team like, like you know New York would be able to ante up. By the way, the Mets – as much money as they're spending, they also gonna have to pay Pete Alonso, who's on the brink of getting out of arbitration. So gonna have to, he's going to get a nice big fat contract too. So Cohen can't run ju just his payroll to a billion dollars and then pay another five hundred million in luxury taxes. He can, I don't think he's going to. So it just makes too much sense for Manny not to be here. I agree with pretty much everything you just said. And I think the number you threw out there makes a lot of sense kind of in that mid three range or mid, uh, mid 30 range, uh, mid 300 range in terms of total value. Uh, what, what's interesting is just the fact that, you know, he's got the five extra years after this. So you can just kind of tinker with when you want to start it, right? Are we adding five years to the back end of it? Are we playing out this year or the next year and then tacking something on to to the back end of that? And we've seen with these extended contracts, I mean, obviously it's, you know, it's going to be in that 10 year range. So I don't know how much that part will really kind of uh, vary, but um, how, how they handle it from that standpoint, like when the starting point is of the new contract or the extension of the new money, um, they can ma manipulate in a lot of different ways. Uh, right. Can and you I was, front load it? Can you do forty million for five years at the beginning and then drop it off at the end so it's more palatable sure. for the Padres? You know, get, there there are ways to get around this. And the thing about baseball contracts is, you know, they're guaranteed. It's not like the NFL where you're trying to backload a deal because you know the guy's not going to be there anyway, and it's the guaranteed money and the signing bonus all you have to worry about. You you can move these things around any way that you want to because the guy's getting the money regardless. Yeah, and I, I think you you make a a very important point. If the Padres win literally one World Series in the next three years, nobody's going to care at that point. Like Manny and Xander are forty, both banking a total of sixty plus million dollars, and they're shells of themselves at that point. And the Padres are winning seventy, eighty, some like. Don't care. Got a ring. <laughs> yeah. There's going to be a, a banner or a sign or a ribbon or something with the world series on it. There's going to be t -shirt, every, you know, everybody's going to be holding tight to that memory of experiencing something that they've never experienced before because of these guys. Like it just, it just won't matter. And if that's what it takes to lock those guys in long-term and extend this window, which is obviously it's already been extended to some degree with Tatis locked in with Bogarts locked in with Darvish and Musgrove locked in. Um, if you can add to that with Machado and give yourself a chance to, to capitalize on that, this year, next year, the year after, what happens if you if you reach the mountaintop? It just doesn't matter whatever happens and what year is it now? 2032, 2033, Fernando has a point. Well, no, I have a question. Do they get, uh, do, do the contracts, do they get taxed for every state that they go to the way in the NFL they do or no? 
I don't know. Uh, yeah, it's yeah, that's the yeah, that's an IRS thing. Yeah, there's not gonna okay. be too much math here because my eyes will start glossing <laughs> over. But, but yeah, that's why that's why professional sports and entertainment accountants exist because you get paid based on how much you make in every area that you're in. Right. So especially guys like that's Juan Soto getting traded last year, he was getting Washington income and then California income, but technically you're paid, you know, you know, every two weeks, week to week, you know, whatever it is. So if you made your money on a road trip and that then that check comes in, you got to be taxing wherever you are for that. So yeah, I, I don't you even want to see what a major league baseball W two looks like. It's Padres, it's gotta be it's gotta be crazy. And the Padres go to Mexico City too, so you know they're gonna get taxed down there. Oh yeah. You get international taxes, you're gonna be it's yeah, those those guys make a lot of money to make sure that the guys are able to keep all of their money. It's what that that's one of those don't even start getting into it because yeah we're never going to comprehend it therefore we can never explain it to the audience but yes it's like um, like we got beyonce tickets right she's doing a, a whole north american tour whole world tour she's going to get whatever concert um tickets are in sofi stadium she'll get taxed on wherever they are at metlife stadium she'll get taxed on it's it's it's, it's all however which much she makes each one getting taxed at each and at each state's tax level which is which really one are you going to which which one? One? Which they want to know which Beyonce show you're going to. Oh, uh, yeah. SoFi Stadium, uh, early September. You going to that folks, one too? Folks, be on the lookout for Derek. He'll be out there. He'll be the dude without a shirt on. <laughs> he's going to be singing to everything Beyonce. He's a, oh, he's, yeah. in the, he's in the Beehive. I'm learning something about I didn't realize Derek was part of the Beehive. He is. Oh, absolutely. Uh, Derek, the best halftime Super Bowl show of all time is Beyonce. And it's not even, it's not even close. The, the, it, this is like, I've never seen her live. My wife has seen her twice. It's I, all I can equate it to is like, see, like for this generation, if you were to see Aretha Franklin or Diana Ross live, it's it's like that level of just pure entertainer. It, you don't see this come around very often. So, you know, you, you got to take the chance when you can. Yeah, and, no, I think it's awesome. Happen, right? All the single ladies, everybody's going to be like, oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I, be, I, I was smart though because with my wife i did put a ring on it yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. so she is not one of those single ladies exactly so no screaming uh this well, this screaming will tell you crazy. actually i want to ask you a question darnay to kind of turn this around if you're saying and i was thinking i was wondering this point myself turner if we don't care what happens in 2031 right because we got a ring does that also apply if the poverty get a ring this year do we care if manny walks does it does it all is does, is the inverse also true where we've got what we want do we need to sign somebody else for that kind of time or hey jackson merrill's ready let's bring him by and see if he can move to third base or 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 what have you whatever you need to do with that like does does it does the inverse also apply if the padres end up with a trophy this year it's a really interesting question something i hadn't considered and it obviously makes it more palatable you know when you experience that it's it's easier to see a guy if, if he's a, helped you achieve the ultimate thing and he decides, you know what, I've accomplished what I want to accomplish. I have a chance to make some more money elsewhere. I'm going to do that. I mean, you can't you can't fault him now. It's it's disappointing in that you're losing that guy. You're losing a guy that means a lot to your franchise. Right. And so that's always going to sting. Um, I, I think Manny gets a huge ovation regardless in that situation. You know, talk about a hero's welcome. I think if Manny does many things and helps them win a World Series and, and comes back next year with, you know, wearing another another uniform, uh, you know, he's gonna, not the Dodgers. That's always the <laughs> he's he's going to be uh, beloved regardless. But that's you know, that's really interesting. The other thing, too, is like I think it's easy for us to say, oh, no, it, it won't matter. The fact of the matter is, you know, that would probably still be a playoff team. And if, you know, if you lose in the DS or the CS and you feel like, man, we are one Manny Machado away, that it's still going to sting at that point. I mean, it's it's uh, ha having just gone through something like that. I will say I spent a lot of time thinking about Super Bowl 52 after Super Bowl 57 because I had that memory banked and I had that good experience banked. But it still stings and it still hurts and you don't know when you get another opportunity again. And I think when you do have a Manny Machado around, if they win it all this year and he's there, you're like, shoot, we could have we could go on a roll here. And I think whenever almost in any league, except for like maybe the I think after the Rams won it, there was maybe some idea of like, I don't know if we're going to be able to capture this again. Um, but there's a lot of instances where you win one and you're like, oh, we might be able to go on a roll. And if you keep Manny Machado around, 
you have that feeling because of the talent that that is around. But that's a that's a really interesting twist that I I hadn't considered before. And I think seeing him walk will will would be painful regardless. But if you win it all, it's like, thank you for all that you've done. We, we couldn't have gotten anything more out of you. We appreciate you. Um, you've given us the greatest memories that this city has ever experienced. And, uh, you know, do li- live your best life. We wish you would be with with us, but um, you, you couldn't deliver more than you already have. So I don't know. Let me ask you this. What if Manny Machado walking means <laughs> for the next five years you get Blake Snell and Josh Hader? I think I, I, you know, all the hype, I've actually been like musing the pop of these around in my head going, what if, you know, cause, cause the, the, the Soto thing is another year away, right? Let's, let's not worry about that. It's not, it's like Juan Soto or Manny Machado or it's, I mean, and then Otani is the, the pipe dream. Like that's, that's the little, the carrot at the end, you know, the Padres will talk to him. You don't, you don't know. So let's not even start going down the, the rabbit hole yet of Machado or Otani, because obviously it's Otani because it's always Otani. But if you could, if you could hang on to, you know, especially if Snell has a really good year this year, if you hang on to to Snell and Hater long term, let's say the next five years, does that mean more? Can you can you find another third baseman to give you enough versus find another starting pitcher and the most elite closer in the game, not named Edwin Diaz? Oh man. You're uh, you're really throwing some tricky hypotheticals at me right now. I think I still this prefer is what we do. I think I still prefer the timeline where Manny Machado is in a Padres uniform, and I've and I've thought, you know, I've just looking at these the, the contracts that are up. You know, Haters making fourteen, Snell's making sixteen. His average, I think, is closer to ten. Drew Pomeranz is making ten. His average, I think, is closer to eight. And, and the other thing off after this year all three come off after this year. And so you're looking at 40 million just in terms of what those guys are making this year. And uh, what happens after 2025, there's another 12 plus million that comes off the books in Eric we Cosmer. Yes, in Eric who, Cosmer. Yeah. Sorry. I just want to make sure those, those yeah. perfectly clear. Oh, yeah. uh, uh, um, so there's uh, and, and that's why I was thinking about, you know, when, when the extension triggers and you know you have this money coming off the books and you have that extra dozen coming off the books and so you can kind of manipulate it that way um all that to say the money would appear to be there but i think with that hypothetical then does that not increase your chances of keeping juan soto around as well i think you mentioned snell and hater certainly um and i've i've always been a big snell apologist and would love to see him have a great season and, and stick around i think with both those guys Drew Pomeranz is the one that like we basically haven't seen him pitch since 2020. And so if that $10 million walks out the door with him, I know you're a huge Drew Pomeranz fan, but I think for most of the fan base, it's like, okay, we haven't really seen him, you know, no, no yeah, harm anything, done. Anything you get for him is gravy at this point. Yeah. And that's more money you can throw at Soto and Machado, et cetera, et cetera, or Snell or, or Hater. Um, and it's, it's interesting because they've, they've generally taken a cost effective approach to the closer role. Kirby was only making a couple few million. Uh, Trevor Rosenthal, you know, they got, I would, I was, I'd assume on a cheap deal in that trade with the Royals. I don't think he was making a whole lot. I might be wrong about that. Um, Mark. He had a minor league deal before that. He pitched his way onto the Royals roster. Hmm. Mark Melanson wasn't making a ton of money and all of a sudden they're, they're paying a closer of $14 million. And so that's kind of a shift in, I don't want to say their philosophy, but just on how they're kind of balancing their budget. So, and they've been able to, again, you know, they weren't going on deep runs. They did get to the NLDS with, with Rosenthal and he was really good. Um, I guess where my mind goes is like, how effective could you be? Suarez is already there. So they have a baked in kind of backup plan or succession plan at the closer spot behind Hader. He's locked in for X amount of years. That's where I kind of think, you know what, if it, as much as I like Josh Hader, as good as Josh Hader is, um, they've found ways to be effective in late innings without a 14 million plus dollar guy. I, I, I wonder if that's a more, a reasonable plan if it keeps 
Machado around or, or uh, gives you a greater chance of keeping Juan Soto around. I think Derek's frozen. I think Derek's disappeared. I've stumped Derek with my my outlook on the situation, and he's just uh, he's flabbergasted. He's just completely speechless. Um, and and Derek has disappeared from the stream. Um, so that's that's one of the kind of interesting hypotheticals. And again, I I thought about it from the keeping Machado standpoint. And where do you have to sacrifice on the other end? Um, maybe you have to get cheaper with that spot in the rotation. Blake Snell, maybe you have to get cheaper at the um at the closer spot, but you've got these contracts coming off the books and then Eric Hosmer a couple years later. And so I think there's money to keep him around. Um, Derek said his internet just died well, and that'll be one but moment. You don't, you don't want to lose the leadership that Manny brings to the team also. And that's another part of it. Now, I think, you know, people have asked about Xander Bogarts being part of the succession plan. Um, as it pertains to Manny Machado and being able to shift over to third base. And again, you've got Jackson Merrill, and obviously you already got Hasso Kim and Fernando Tatis Jr. around, so you can fill that left side of the infield. But he's also earned some praise just in terms of his leadership capabilities as well. Um, but again, like Manny Machado has been that dude and done a fantastic he's job. Grown up. And, he's grown up here in San Diego. and that's the part of that's the part we didn't know about Manny Machado. Yeah. Um we didn't know that he would have that type of influence, that he would take on that type of role. And so I think that's where he's got every right to ask for more money. And you can't fault him for that because not only has he performed at a high level, um, just based on the numbers, making all-star teams, being an MVP finalist on two occasions, especially last year. I mean, just, you know, taking... Tatis to task in 2021, yeah. the dugout situation and the way they handled that. And then last year without Tatis carrying the team offensively and then being Soto was still trying to figure that out. leader. Other guys were still kind of trying to, and Matt yeah. was the one that at the end of the season was the one that mm -hmm. really drove this home, especially with Trent Grisham obviously getting hot as well. But yeah, it was all, it was Manny, the one that really led this. this no uh, question. No question. Yeah. Um, he's been, an absolute stud. And so, yeah, that's another factor when you, when you kind of think about it, that's, you know, you're not just filling third base. You're not just filling a, you know, 300 hitter. That's basically going to, you know, lock them in for 30 homers a year. Um, it's not just that, that you're having to account for. It's the intangibles. It's the maturity. It's also the baseball IQ. I mean, when you watch him, especially playing third base, like incredibly, incredibly smart. And you could have a, a guy that, you know, maybe he's younger, maybe more athletic, what have you. Um, but just the intelligence that Manny Machado plays with, um, the leadership, you see the way he's involved, you know, whenever there's a meeting on the mound and, and that sort of thing. He just does so much for this team. And so it's another reason to, you know, where you're hesitant to explore other timelines where, you know, maybe you have a stud closer, uh, another stud in the rotation, but you lose out on, on, Manny, that's uh, I, I find myself still kind of drawn to the situation where Manny Machado is in a Padres uniform. But then we're going to be having this conversation again as it pertains to um, what about the swag? Juan Soto, the swag on his feet, the Jordans, like he's always popping <laughs> the new ones. That's true, I, that's one of my favorite things about Manny Machado. His first year. He's like, he was like, what are you looking at your my locker room for? I'm like, oh, I like your Jordans. He's like, you want to see these? These haven't even come out yet. He showed me some. I'm like, dang, okay. I was like, yeah. you got that, you got that fire in your feet. He's like, yeah, bro, got you. <laughs> so yeah, no, he's got swag. So I'm all about it. We, uh, I'm. Derek thinks it might be storm related. His his issues because he's now having a tough time logging on. You might need to swing around and get on a microphone here, Fernando. So we can hear you a little bit better, um, but we'll see. He's going to try and join on his phone. So we'll see how this goes. Apologies for the technical difficulties with Derek. Um, but if you haven't looked outside, um, it's kind of it's kind of crazy right now. There was the hail in the middle of the night. I woke up at 430 to feed the twins. I've never heard it that loud um, in our house before. I looked outside and it was dumping hail. It's kind of crazy. It's 80 degrees in Carolina. 
Carolina. Isn't that crazy? And here we are. Hail but and wind. And I think Machado also is going to do good for Fernando Tatis' maturity as well. I think, yeah, I th- uh, definitely. I, I think he already has. And, oh, do we have Derek back? I think we might have Derek back. Uh, I close this out. Add to stream. Oops. There we go. He's back. Yeah, that's it. Weather in San Diego, dude. It just <laughs> screws everything up. We get a couple drops of rain. So what you guys talk about? And I was going. Uh, we are talking about Manny's leadership. The new mm-hmm. podcast that you and Todd Train are going to start called the Marvel Universe. Oh the gosh. Let's keep Jefferson. let we let's keep let's keep things on task here. All right. We already that's went on our Beyonce. I went back and watched Agents of tangent. Shield. The, the, the episodes with the Ghost Rider in it. Man, I forgot how well they did the Ghost Rider in those. They did a really good job with those. <laughs> yeah, I'm down with that. Anything to make me forget the Nicolas Cage films is good is good by me. <laughs> so we'll flip it to you. I mean, you you threw the, the Snell hater hypothetical and the potential impact that could have on Soto. What, how would you feel about that? I think if Juan Soto wins two World Series and by the age of 25, by the way, his birthday is in October, so he'll like be turning mm-hmm. 25 right during the World Series. He doesn't care about that anymore. He's going for the money, which who wouldn't? <laughs> no, I, I know I would. Yeah. So um, I, I think if the, if the Padres win the World Series this year, then you can more or less count on Juan Soto being gone after 2024 anyway, hmm. because you'll have two rings in two different places with franchises who had never won them before, by the way. Yeah. So he, he will have accomplished what he wants to anyway at that point. So then it's just, well, what are you going to do the rest of your career? Go live in a place you want to live, play with dudes you want to play with. It's almost like the he's got the LeBron James thing, right? He can just be like, I want to play with that dude, that dude, and that dude in this place. And he can, he can go and do it. So th- he can more or less – he probably would be gone anyway. So – then you're looking at who do you, who can you keep long term? What other kind of star power can we find to come over here? And then you're going to look at okay, this this if you lose Manny and you lose Soto, you got a lot of capital all of a sudden with a team that just won a World Series and a, you know a lot a lot of money in the coffers. So you can there. I don't want to fall into the trap of going all right. If we don't have Manny, we have nothing. If we don't have Soto, we have nothing. There are other players out there you can find. You can still you know, swing trades for. You, you can develop. You, you can find guys who can still help you win the World Series. Remember the 2004 Red Sox. They had shot after shot after shot. And then they traded Nomar Garcia Parra. And they won the World Series. And everyone thought that was completely counterintuitive. Why are you getting rid of your best player? Well, because he wasn't the guy they needed in that moment. They needed a better defensive shortstop. They went and got Orlando Cabrera. They won the World Series. Gave him just enough offense, better defensively. He was the, one of those guys who was better in the clubhouse. It worked. They, they did it. So sometimes you can lose a superstar and put in a guy who maybe fits the system better and still be every bit as good as you were before because, what do you know, Dustin Pedroia becomes a thing. You just mm-hmm. don't know who's going to step up and, and become a guy in those situations. Now, am I saying that's going to happen? Absolutely not. What I'm saying, it's not you know gloom and doom if Manny and Soto were not here uh, in 2025 and beyond, it would suck. I would hate it. And I would yeah. love to see them be here for the rest of their careers. But realistically, you can find other ways to b- be a really good baseball team, which AJ Preller has shown the ability to do. It's a great point. And it's something that I've kind of, uh, it's come to mind a little bit as we've considered all this. If it's not them, it's probably going to be somebody else. You know, I, I I don't know that they're going to stop spending. Maybe they see it as an opportunity to dip back below the luxury tax threshold because we know how the penalties kind of uh, magnify year in and year out. You know, if you if you continue to um, go above that plateau, so you know maybe maybe they view it as a chance to kind of you know, get under the threshold a little bit and, you know, shake off some of those penalties. But I, I think they're going to continue to to be aggressive, especially if they see like, hey, Bogarts is here for a while. Tatis is here for a while. We've locked these guys in. Um, are we going to settle for being, you know, just a wild card team, a team that's good enough to make the playoffs? I don't know. Um, you know, I think that'll that'll be a test of, you know, what the fr- the front office wants to do, because, again, what. How does their approach change if they have won a World Series? Because we've been hearing about that so long, and Siler is is determined to do that. Well, if they do that, is there as much determination to, to do it twice? Um, now, if they've got all these guys around, then it kind of happens organically. But if they're in a position to have to kind of make some hard decisions, 
do they do they approach it more conservatively than they're doing right now since they don't have that you know in hand i don't know yeah that's what we don't know that that that's the great unknown it's a great thing to have to figure out because what what we're operating under the assumption that they've just won a world series and so uh you know yeah, it, exactly. it'd be like, nice to be in that position at that point you know <laughs> we'll be good to figure it out at that point um i i i'm i'm still kind of unsure you know kind of circling back to just the manny hypothetical like what does the february 16th like how much weight is there to that february 16th deadline you know are 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 AJ Preller and Dan Lozano just having conversations to the side and keeping Manny, you know, insulated from that because he wants to focus on baseball and AJ said they're going to kind of respect that, but obviously be open to the conversations. Do do he and Dan just remove Manny from the group text and you know send numbers back and forth to one another until they feel like okay, you know, Liz Lozano says all right, this this is. This might be palatable. Um, let me approach Manny with this in mid June or what have you. Um, so that's the thing that I'm kind of curious about. But I just think there's obviously motivation from the Padre standpoint. I think Manny likes being here. I think he wants to be here. And with the money that we've referenced, now what, 52 million over the next three years, not even including like a bunch of other guys that are on shorter or 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 lesser deals. Um, I just think the money's going to be around. Uh, are you able to keep Juan Soto around if you know if if he returns to peak level of Juan Soto, a guy that turned down a four hundred million dollar contract? That could be pretty darn difficult. But I think in terms of Manny Machado, I I would think your chances are pretty good. I just think the money's there and the motivation is there. It's just a matter of kind of keeping that dialogue going. But remember, April 29th, twenty ninth, twenty twenty two, Ken Rosenthal reported that there was an impasse between. Joe Musgrove and the San Diego Padres. And what did we see? Who do we see on the, the dais in the Padres press room the week of uh, the trade deadline? Joe Musgrove. Hey, what do you know? Yeah. <laughs> There's Joe Musgrove. Yeah. Talking about, million dollar way, talking about uh, not only that, but the recent trade for Josh Hader. Yeah. 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 Because yeah, that yeah, was so a day or two before the actual deadline. It was a busy week. That was a fun week. Um, yes. but a lot can happen and, um, we'll see how much it hangs over this season. And Machado has been willing to, the other thing too, I, I'm, there's been some people saying, oh, why is Manny talking about this? And he's not just like gathering people around and saying, Hey, let everybody, let's talk about my contract situation. People are asking him questions about it. And maybe he's right. being more, he's divulging more of his stance and, and his plans than people are comfortable with. But I keep seeing people being critical of Manny Machado. Like, why is he talking about this? this is a distraction. Well, it's because all of us are surrounding him and peppering him with questions about it. So, um, I don't know how that happens. Isn't it? Uh, yeah. I don't necessarily fault him for that. And I don't fault him, you know, maybe, maybe he's playing chess and I'm just playing checkers in my brain, but you know, him declaring that he's going to opt out, you know, we've also seen situations with like the Kevin Durant's of the world where nobody knows what he's going to do. And that's just as much of a distraction because it's like, well, are you going to stick around or are you going to go? Um, and so I my surface level view is, well, at least he's let the Padres in on his plans and his intentions. Now he can always change that. You know, God forbid something happens or whatever. Um, but am I dumb in thinking, well. Like at least the Padres have a pretty clear idea of what's going on, and then they can kind of plan accordingly. No, you're not. You're not dumb in thinking that whatsoever. It's absolutely. It's absolutely a possibility. Let me throw another name at you, Corbin Burns. <laughs> oh man, what a disaster the Milwaukee Brewers are going back to trading Josh Hader. I mean, they mm -hmm. are such an yep. unserious franchise right now. It's uh, it's shameful what they're doing. A team that was battling for a playoff spot trade their their stud closer uh fell apart and then just dragged their star their ace through the mud in arbitration talks i mean talking about doing it all wrong what if <laughs> if manny goes you add josh hater and corbin burns and oh by the way blake snow 
yeah i mean it's again it's it's more palatable uh i don't oh man i don't know i still don't know if i prefer it because i think you can i mean you can if you keep machado you probably can still keep one of snell or hater don't you think Snell more so than Hater, I would think. Again, unless Blake goes out and just has a lights out year this year and then tears everybody up and goes back to looking like the 2018 Blake Snell, then you're talking about a different story. You know, if he's been the Blake Snell that we've seen for the Padres since he was you know traded here, then yeah, you could probably afford him and a new contract with um with Manny. If he goes out and lights it up, yeah, well, well, now now what? You yeah. know, but it, there's here's what I'm looking at is if I'm wrong. And it could very well be. And Manny does not come back here. What are you doing with that five years and 350 million left? I'm sorry, five years and 150 million left mm -hmm. on his contract. Well, what if you turn that into five years of Blake Snell, Josh Hader, and Corbin Burns? Can you do that? You know, still, or maybe, or maybe if it's those it's three for team. five years at a total of 200. Yeah. Is that is that is that more palatable than Manny being there? Is it if is it uh, you know, improving in the aggregate? You know, like they say in Moneyball, you're getting better. You're you're holding on to three positions. You're improving your starting rotation dramatically with a guy who's you know, going to be 29 years old and one of the best pitchers in the game. And then you, yeah, are you losing one, arguably the best third baseman in baseball and a first ballot future Hall of Famer? Yes, you are. And he's right in the middle of his prime. But are you getting better at other spots and it makes up for it? So I think my... I'll answer your question with a question. Are you spending that money on Corbin Burns, Blake Snow, or Josh Hader saying, all right, we're saving up for Juan Soto? Depends if you win the World Series this year. Depends, depends on what um, – <laughs> again, no, exactly. Because that's – if Soto has unfinished business then he wants, and he wants to stay, well, then, yeah, you have to you have to pay him. I, I've, almost, I've more or less written off Juan Soto as being here long term hmm. in my head. Okay. In my head. Now, maybe if Manny's not here, maybe that changes that. Um, I just, some of the times I've, I've, I've talked to him, I've seen him in conversations, even going back to the all-star game when I was talking to him, it just, it just feels like he's going to be out for every last cent that he can get. And again, nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. More power to him. Get what you're paid, get what you're worth. If you want to get, if you think you're worth this, go out and get it. I will never begrudge anyone for doing that, but it feels like that's going to do it. I think that's going to, given all the other major contracts the Padres have, that's going to probably price him out. Because I know one thing the Padres do not want to do is be locked into we're paying one superstar. I said with the Nationals we're facing, we're paying, playing one superstar, and he's we're and winning seventy five games every year because we have nothing else. I don't mm -hmm. think they want to put themselves in that situation. So that's what Juan Soto kind of feels like to me. And again, I could be completely wrong on this, but it feels like he's going to be. I want I want the record setting. I want to beat the Mike Trout contract. Mm -hmm. I want more than that. And just the Padres. They shouldn't do that, even, even for that guy, especially when you can take that money and turn it into four other all-star caliber players who can help you win more consistently down the road. That's a very good point. Yeah, I, I think Soto's always felt a little bit trickier uh, to navigate, just given what he had already turned down. And now if he has a chance to prove prove himself, I don't know if that's really right. But, you know, show that he is one Soto for two years in a Padres uniform. Um I, I don't think there's any reason to believe that all of a sudden at what 26 years old, he's going to be like, no, nah, I'm, I'm good with taking less than I was willing to take, Dude, especially the way the contracts are going it. up. You know what I mean? And like, I even thought about that with like the Machado money in 10 years, like who knows what 35 million will, will seem like, you know, in, in, in three or four months, M Musgrove's deal already felt like a bargain. So what's going to happen in 10 years? I think 35 million is always going to be like a lot of money, but it might not sting quite to the extent that it, it feels like it will now. Um, yeah, what is the end game for baseball contracts? I was wondering that too. I mean, because here's here's what's going to screw everything up is next year, whatever Otani gets, if it's 10 years and 500 million, which he's worth it. <laughs> you know, mm. given what he gives you 50 million a year, he is worth it. Does everyone else who doesn't give you what he gives you as both on the mound and as an offensive threat, do they start thinking that's the, the benchmark? And that's not only the benchmark, that's the baseline. Yeah. It can't be that way. Like, where's where where do we hit the, the point where it's like, we're not going above this. Nobody's getting above this. This is where it ends. And I honestly don't know where this, I think we're close to that now, but 
but I don't, I don't know what that number truly is. So 400, so probably in the, in the low 400 is going to be my guess. That's going to be right now. The angels, if you, if you ask them, if they think that they've gotten their money's worth on the Mike Trout deal, they will tell you, no, hmm. they might tell you yes publicly, but they will <laughs> tell you, no, if, if you are telling them they have to pump them full of truth serum and they'll tell you, no, they haven't gotten what, what they should have gotten out of that contract. Injuries, of course, have played a part in that. The fact they haven't put any talent around him to get into the postseason. He's been to more Eagles playoff games than Angels playoff games. <laughs> that is a fact. That Eagles is a played in a lot of playoff fact. games the last few years. So yeah. So he's been to three playoff games. He never won one. Again, not his fault. <laughs> you know, you need, baseball is like his four. You need to have pitching too. You mm-hmm. can't just say, "Hey, Patrick Mahomes, go win a game for us," and he can do that. Outfielders can't do that for you. Now they can give you a whole hell of a lot and they can, they can win you games when they're in those situations. And the guys who take the most advantage of those few situations they get, those are the ones you pay the most because that makes a difference over the course of an entire season and an entire career. But it's very different when you're talking about, you know, you, you can't just have a dude go out and win one pass rusher can't take over a baseball game and have you win that game. It, it, JJ Watt is not going to happen in the American league West. It, it's it's where, where's the end point here? And I think we're probably, again, really close to it in the low 400s would be my guess. And then we'll have to see what that does to the next collective bargaining agreement. And then guys, the owners will cry poor again. And then we'll have another lockout. And then everything's going to go look like they'll get all screwed up. And then contracts will go right back up. I don't know what's going to happen. But I know the Potter is in a really good spot right now to take advantage as they can in the next two years. Certainly. And we've got an opportunity in the next couple of years to have – a couple contracts that like set set the benchmark um as fernando shows me uh, a tweet from john Heyman: could otani become the first 600 million dollar player he could um He's between otani to. between otani and soto that will kind of set the benchmark and everybody will have to kind of slot in below those guys because of age and and what they've accomplished um they're going to kind of be the cream of the crop there so but um, we've talked about this with otani though you know you look at him offensively, he puts up Manny Machado numbers. Now, he doesn't give you the defense that Manny does, and that's, that is a component of a contract. But on the mound, he gives you Garrett Cole with a better ERA numbers. Well, those two guys combined make $66 million bucks a year. Yeah. So you could legitimately argue, take away the defense at third base component, the gold glove caliber ability at third base, that Otani's worth $60 million bucks a year. And if you do that over a 10-year deal, that's $600 million which sounds obscene to think about, but mm-hmm. legitimately given what baseball economics are, that's where we are. Yeah. Well, uh, we've explored some interesting timelines. I, this is the fun of doing a podcast with Derek. You just never know what he's going to pepper you with. And and the, the inner workings of the brain of Derek Togerson can be a, a, a strange and exciting place. Um, it's and, dangerous in here, man. It's, it's scary. It's, it's dangerous. Scary and sometimes. so I've had to, yeah, my, I think I've pulled a few muscles in my brain just trying to figure out where I would land on some of these hypotheticals. So let us know what Padres Manny timeline you you prefer obviously the one that involves them winning a world series and being mm-hmm. like yolo who cares we already did it um but uh you know drop it in the comments on youtube hit us up on twitter uh what have you and and let us know what you think any other uh thoughts before we close up shop and look forward to games on friday we'll obviously have more to talk about what we see and then guys start shipping off the wbc and and this and that um but uh anything else in your mind before we uh wrap it up just really excited for Nick Martinez because he's he gets to go and you know obviously the you know, the the team USA got, got finally wised up and said we got to get rid of this Kershaw slacker and bring in a real pitcher and they so they brought in Nick Martinez and I'm saying that tongue in cheek people on the podcast um, now the, I'm not saying Nick's not getting never mind shut up um, you should have just leaned into it Derek why you shouldn't yeah. have hedged why'd you hedge you know, because I don't want to because I don't want to deal because people just I I can't. Um, I'm I'm done with most folk. Um, the uh, the fact that he gets to pitch for Team USA again, because cool. again, having talking have to talk to him about how much this means to him. His family is of, of Cuban descent. Mm-hmm. Um, got to come to America and start a brand new life, and he, to hear him talk about it is it means so much to him and his family to put the USA on and be able to go and represent the country. He did it for the Olympic team when they won a silver medal in Tokyo. Um, and was just incredibly happy to be able to do that. Now he gets to go and, and do it again with the World Baseball Classic team that has a legitimate chance to repeat, which sounds so weird because it was six years ago. 
you know, yeah. the, the the lockout and the pandemic, we couldn't we couldn't have the the World Baseball Classic. But now it's back after six years, and and U.S. has been defending champs this entire time. So <laughs> for, to be able to to defend that crown, I'm I'm really really excited and happy for him that he gets to to go out and do that because it, it hurt him to have to leave that team because they wanted him to be a reliever and he had to stretch himself out for a starter's workload. He wanted to do it, but he also knew that, hey, the Padres are paying my bills, but I got to do what they need me to do. So now he gets the best of both worlds to a dude who I, I really uh, like, and I think he's a really a really good human being. So um, really excited for Nick Martinez to be able to go do that again. Said it perfectly. Um, no notes, nothing I could add to that. Um, well done. I think we're all fans of Nick and excited to see just another Padre, you know, especially in in – in that type of position, get a chance to start a game, you know, and, and the spotlight that comes with that. Uh, yeah, about 11 Padres on seven different countries. That's awesome. That's it's gonna incredible. Be it's going to be a lot of fun to watch uh, in March. So I'm, I'm very much looking forward to that. Uh, this was a fun one. Uh, again, uh, as, as you know, you can find us in your podcast app, but again, NBC seven YouTube page, there is the on fire playlist nbc7.com we are posting a video of all episodes and the nbc7 streaming app uh lots of places you can find on fryer and and we appreciate you watching and listening uh wherever you choose uh thanks for hanging out with us enjoy cactus league games and we'll uh see you next week